Well, the main challenge of legal education in a globalized world is to keep up with the tremendous uh, changes that globalization is bringing to legal practice and everything that lawyers touch. So globalization is reshaping markets, it's reshaping law, it's reshaping legal institutions, and it's therefore reshaping the skills and the understandings and the knowledge that lawyers need to do, need to have in order to be effective in this context. So we are leaving a, a world that we were very comfortable with, that we thought we understood, that we thought we knew what the role of lawyers were and therefore what the role of legal education is. And then moving to a world that we don't even fully understand what the broad outlines are going to be. And so that makes it extremely difficult to figure out what, how we ought to be preparing lawyers to Lawyers were allowed to think of themselves as operating in a very confined space. Uh, and we also thought that there were sharp distinctions between law and politics and uh, the economy or culture or sociology. None of those things are true anymore. Maybe they were never true, but we certainly understand they're not true. And so we have to rethink how we train lawyers to operate in a inherently and increasingly fluent and dynamic environment in which the borders of geography, of legal systems, of traditional institutions, it's not that they're irrelevant, but they're no longer nearly as constraining as they once were. Well, the traditional role of the law professor was to be an expert in the law and in some particular area of law, an increasingly narrow and specialized area of the law, and that this was traditionally thought to be divorced, not just from other areas of inquiry, intellectual inquiry, but also from the practice of law and from the actual working of lawyers. That, may, again, that may never have been the right way to approach it, but we no longer, it seems to be, have the luxury of thinking about law professors as people who specialize in something called law that is distinct either from other areas of inquiry or from practice. You know, we have these jobs, which are very privileged jobs in many ways, uh, because we have the ability to do what almost no one else in the world has the luxury of doing, which is to step back from the day-to-day -day pressures and to try to think creatively and independently about important problems. I think the thing that we, to the extent that we owe the world something. We owe the world to give our objective, independent, uh, grounded opinions about the complex problems that are facing us today. And I think in order to do that, we have to be sufficiently engaged in the world to understand what those problems are and what uh, what a reasonable range of solutions to those problems might be. You know, problems don't come separated in legal problems, economic problems, political problems, social problems. They come intertwined together. And this is partly why I've always thought it's crucial for law professors to be engaged with lawyers in how lawyers think and understand legal problems. Because lawyers have never thought, at least the best lawyers, have never thought that legal problems are separate from these other areas of thought. They have to deal in a world that is messy and complex. Mostly the law and movement has been just that. It's been law and economics. And there actually has been very little integration and new learning around something that is 
a new field at the intersection rather than two different fields put together. And I think that's the challenge for legal education in the 21st century. It's how not just to import knowledge, but to create new knowledge that comes from a meaningful and deep engagement across what had been traditional disciplinary fields and across the largest chasm of all, which is theory and practice. Uh, you know, the debate about legal education today is so much about, you know, is it too theoretical? Does it need to be more practical? In my view, legal education needs to be both more theoretical and more practical, and that the practice has to be informed by the theory, and the theory has to stand up to the discipline of, I of interaction with the practice. And until we think about creating something new, as opposed to simply just putting things together that remain separate, I think we won't have answered the challenge. Well, I think the most important thing law schools have to teach is for people to be adaptive and flexible. Because whatever we think the right balance of, you know, you know, what's the law, the European Union law and competition, and what's the Chinese law and competition. By the time the students get out there, it's probably going to be different, and the places where law is important or that they're going to need to learn are going to change. Now, that, I think, means teaching them much more, quote, foreign law, which we just mean non-US law, than they are currently being taught simply because they won't know how to recognize legal problems or legal issues in other kinds of jurisdictions that they've had no interaction with them. And, you know, just from a purely competitive standpoint, quite frankly, the rest of the world is doing a much better job of that by teaching the lawyers who are in China and India and Brazil and the other places you mentioned, U.S. EU common law, English common law, and laws of other jurisdictions than we are doing of training our law students in other areas. My own view is that ideally this shouldn't just be a separate course. This should be integrating foreign sources of law or non-US sources of law legal knowledge, legal institutions, into all the courses that we teach. So rather than thinking of it as a kind of, you know, set prescription, it's rather how do you teach people to be fluid and comfortable enough in identifying and understanding different sources of law so that when they need to do it, they have the resources to be able to go out and figure out what they need to know and how they need to find it out and who they need to talk to. It used to be to think like a lawyer just meant to think like a Supreme Court justice, a famous Supreme Court justice, really. You know, interpreting common law doctrine. That's what it meant to think like a lawyer. I don't think anyone thinks that's actually what does it mean to think like a lawyer or what lawyers need to know to be successful? If you go out, this is why, again, we have to integrate theory and practice. Because if you go out and talk to lawyers about what they do, they spend a very small amount of time thinking like a Supreme Court justice or thinking like a common law lawyer. Not no time. It's important. But they think about a much broader range of things. Uh, in a, in some ways that are much different than the kind of very useful critical thinking skills that traditional legal education uh, inculcates. The issue is what are people thinking Socratically about? What are the problems that they're being introduced to? What are the sources that they're being asked to examine? What are the biases that they're being asked to face? And how do we structure the dialogue? So the challenge is, what does it mean to think like a lawyer today? Not that we should abandon the quest to teach people how to think like a lawyer. It's rather, 
What does it mean to think like a lawyer in this new environment? I'm uh, fortunate enough to be the director of a global research collaborative called Globalization, Lawyers, and Emerging Economies, or GLEE as we like to call it. Uh, and that is really trying to understand exactly this question. What, how is globalization reshaping the market for legal services in important new emerging economies such as India, China, and Brazil? My view is that this will, that this process is both critical and in some sense inevitable as, as the balance of power and influence shifts around the world. Much of the new innovation in the world is likely to come from what might be thought of as the global south to the global north. And that's likely to be true in law and legal practice and legal institutions just as much as it is in the kind of technology or economic enterprises. Look where innovation typically comes from. It doesn't come from old established players. Old established players have a pretty good life and they tend to uh, reproduce. I always say to people, why should you want to just reproduce Harvard Law School or reproduce Cravath or reproduce you know, take your pick, the, you know, uh, um, I, IBM or, or, Gen or GE. You should be looking how to leapfrog over. You can already see in some of the, for example, law schools, if you look at FGV in, uh, in Brazil, or if you look at the Peking School of Transnational Law in, uh, in uh, Shenzhen, or if you look at uh, the Jindal Global Law School, they're doing many things that I think are, are quite innovative around the intersection of theory and practice, about how to teach about law as a global discipline, about how to integrate faculty from around the world. Some of this, of course, they're doing because they have to do it. But I wouldn't count them out. And, and I would say our, our obligation as, as a professor at an established law school in the United States is we should constantly be looking for where the new ideas and the new innovation is coming.